Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast live on Facebook, YouTube and later on our podcast channel. I'm Andrew Musgrove, joined by Aaron Stokes. We hope you guys are doing well. So this is the Monday show and we're here to reflect on Newcastle's fantastic 4-3 victory over West Ham. It's fair to say I don't think anyone saw it coming with half an hour on the clock. We're going to talk about just how United turned it around, the impact of Harvey Barnes and why some owe him an apology. We'll try to pick apart another round of injuries to key players, why the victory was so important, and also look at the errors that allowed United to fall so far behind in the first place, and a little preview of Tuesday's game against Everton. This is the Everything is Black and White podcast. Please hit like, subscribe or follow. Let's get on with the show. Aaron, how we doing? A nice week off. You feeling refreshed? Yeah, feeling very good. And I think, you know, I only worked one day last week and that was the uh, the match day. So I think I picked a pretty good one, um, as as you said earlier and, and summed it up very well. I don't think anybody was expecting to be sat here watching this podcast talking about a win um, when Jared Bowen put the ball on the net. But yeah, look, absolutely fantastic comeback and uh, a positive podcast on the way, I imagine. Yes, yes, plenty of positives to talk about. I'm, uh, I'm back working after a nice, stressful week of moving house. Still no internet, um, so thanks to my provider, I'm back at my parents' house bringing you this live podcast. But as Aaron says, it's going to be a positive one. Um, yeah, like we say, half an hour on the clock, I turned to uh, the chap next to me and said, something needs to happen here because I do a little bit of work post match at the ground and I, I I have to talk after the game about the result and uh, I have to say Aaron with 30 minutes on the on the clock remaining I was a little bit worried yeah look when when Bowen scored and, and the manner of how Bowen scored where Newcastle sort of granted him the uh the, the keys to St James's Park and all that space I had sort of similar flashbacks to Boxing Day uh and Nottingham Forest and being 3-1 down and Newcastle just looking, you know, absolutely gone at the game. They looked like their race was ran. Um, and I sort of had real, real feelings of of that game. And I also, you know, sitting in the press box watching these games, you have the luxury of being able to watch the game, but also have a little eye on social media at the same time. And, you know, the I don't need to tell you what the what the feeling was like on, on tweet deck when uh, that third goal went in. And I suspect there was quite a lot of deleted tweets about how and his tactics and uh, some of the players uh, come full time. Um, and, and look, you know, fair play to the credit that Newcastle show because a lot of the times this season we haven't seen that from them. They've gone behind and they haven't been able to, to you know, get a result. I think that is the first time this season they've came from behind to win or come from at least two goals down to get a result. Um, so, yeah, look, fantastic spirit. Um and I think you sort of felt it in the last 10 minutes when that second goal went in, when the penalty went in. There was a little feeling of, OK, this game isn't completely done. Um, and look, credit to, to Barnes and, and the players for getting it over the line. It was a game that had absolutely everything, didn't it? You know, you had VAR, you had penalties, you had managers getting booked, you had, unfortunately, injuries, you had great goals. Didn't have much defensive uh, work to, to write home about, but it was a, a great game for the neutral. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, my phone was absolutely pinging from, as you say, neutral fans who were saying, you know, what a game it was midway through. Um, I don't suspect those West Ham fans who were so uh, giddy and, and, you know, uh, confident at 3-1 had a very pleasant trip back to East London. I was watching one um, fan channel from West Ham yesterday who had a very... Uh, irate Cockney on there talking about Moyes needing to go after that result um, but look I, I think I know what we'll dive into it in, in, in more detail but I think it, it's a result that papers cracks in some ways but it also shows brilliant resilience from Newcastle um, and it's something that we've talked about plenty on this podcast on, on plenty Mondays in the last couple of months about you know is this going to be a false dawn and, and thankfully Newcastle have got a game you know soon after Saturday's win to try and keep that momentum going. Yeah, a very winnable game as well. And we'll talk about Everton uh, towards the end of the show. But the win over West Ham, it does feel like a huge win because for me, had they lost that game and in the manner in which they conceded the goals, that was the season done. It was over. You know, you chuck in the injuries and the confidence of the squad would have been absolutely shot. The mood at the very best would have been gloomy and the season would have limped to a, you know, a forgettable 
end. But now there's a feeling of optimism. And what do you think a win will a win like this will do for Newcastle? You know, at the death from two goals behind, what will it do for the squad's confidence? And do you think it has a slightly different impact, Aaron, than say winning one nil? Um, look, I, th- I think so. I think certainly from, from a fan perspective, I think a win of that nature and coming back and fighting back and showing that great means a lot more and it's, it feels a lot more special. Hopefully the players are feeling that as well. Um, I think just going back to your point, you know, had Newcastle lost that game 3-1 or 4-1 or whatever, I think we really would have seen that groundswell of, of you know opinion turning against Eddie Howe. And I hate to say that, but I just think... You know, to lose on home soil again in that manner would have been, you know, really, really damaging to house credit um, and to those players. And as you say, when you took in the injuries that they've picked up just on Saturday alone, it would have, you know, compi- compounded a pretty dismal afternoon, one of the worst of the season. Um, now, when Newcastle are going into the Everton game thinking, well, you know, this is the springboard, this is the catalyst, this is, you know, how we can, we can kick on. And also, you know, just looking around the league at the results that, other teams had at the weekend. Obviously, beating West Ham is huge. We're now one point behind them with a game in hand. Manchester United, obviously, were very, very lucky to even get a point at um, Brentford, despite scoring that late goal. Brighton, obviously, lose. Wolves get beat. Um, Chelsea drop points at home to 10 men of of Burnley, which annoys me greatly that they've beaten us twice at Stamford Bridge this season. But add everything together, it was a really, really positive weekend for Newcastle United, apart from those injuries, which we'll talk about. Um, but look, how many times have we said this? We said this after Villa. We said it after Fulham. We said it after Forest away. We said it after beating Wolves 3-0 at home where you came out and said, let's not get excited. And I ripped you for it. But you were right because we can't. Until Newcastle start to string some results together for the first time this season, because they haven't really put a run together. Um, we need to keep our feet on the ground. But it was a fantastic win, fantastic atmosphere in the last 20 minutes. And now, you know, use that and, and hopefully patch together 11 men and, and put a team out and beat Everton. Yeah, the team against Everton is certainly going to be an interesting one when that team news does drop. It did feel like a big, big win for Eddie Howe, didn't it? Because at the end, he fist-pumped the Gallagher three or four times, and it, just like Jurgen Klopp does at the cop ends at Anfield. And we don't often see that emotion from him, do we? He's quite a, a close book, Eddie Howe. He's down the middle. You know what you're going to get from him. But every now and then, we'll see him kind of break cover and against West Ham on Saturday, that was an example of it. He looked like he really needed that victory. He looked like he knew exactly what you've just said there, Aaron. If I lose this game, mm-hmm. is the tide going to turn against me? Mm-hmm. You know, The season does just come to a drab end. He looked like he knew that, and his celebration at the end, it was like a release. It was, it was a massive win for him. Yeah, I've, I wrote about this exact topic yesterday, about how celebration, how unusual it was because as you say usually win lose or draw he's very very composed he keeps a very calm demeanor at least in public there was none of that on Saturday you know he obviously celebrates that goal the Harvey Barnes win I get to booting for it um he then obviously comes on the pitch he gives a little couple of fist bumps to the Lisas a couple of roars to the Gallagher um and you could see absolutely that it that it meant the world to him um, and we got a very relaxed and, and upbeat Eddie Howe in the press conference after as opposed to the probably blunt and, and disappointed one we would have got half an hour earlier. Um, he knows, as, as you say, he'll have known the importance of this game. He'll have known the importance of the win. Um, and for all you know, I, I'm sure he's getting those assurances behind the scenes. He's a, he's a very clever man. And he, you know, we always sort of, you know, take the mickey out of him for not wanting to get too far ahead of himself. But he knows that, you know, despite how well last season went, you know, within a year you can be out of, out of any job, no matter how well you've done. So um, it was good to see that sort of human emotion from him. Um, but you know what I was like. And as soon as the celebrations died down Saturday night, it'll have been all focused on Everton. Hmm. I mean, he got so involved in the game that at one point he was running onto the pitch and Jason Tindall, of all people, had to pull him <laughs> back and, and get him off the pitch because the, the, the referee uh, was about to uh, maybe show him a, a second yellow. Uh, that's how much he was. It was just after Gordon, I think, um, was, was was sent off and Eddie Howe, he did. He ran out the pitch to try and organise the defence, but a huge win for him. 
And it does set the the, the the season up nicely for Newcastle in these remaining nine games, as we see Everton next on the cards. I mean, you've mentioned there the league table, Alan. I'll just kind of go over again where this puts Newcastle. So on 43 points, one behind West Ham, who are seventh, five for my United in sixth. Everton, as we see other visitors on Tuesday to St. James's Park. West Ham face Spurs, who, of course, um, are fourth at the moment. My United have Chelsea on Thursday. The race for Europe is very much on, and it's all thanks to this win over West Ham. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, it keeps the season alive. And I think, look, I don't think the season would have been over on Saturday if they got beat. But now, I mean, the table looks so much rosier than it did um, come Saturday morning. Um, And look, I think for West Ham, you know, for what, yes, it'll do wonders for Newcastle confidence, but that'll be a huge hammer blow to them, you know, to lose in that manner after winning 3-1 um, with tricky games ahead. They're still in Europe. They've got Leverkusen um, later this month in a double header, which won't be easy. It's advantage Newcastle now. Win this game on hand tomorrow night and, and they're absolutely laughing. So um, really, really big in the context of the season. A huge win for Howe, a huge win for the team. And I think should Newcastle get over the line and should they put you know a little run together now and get Europe, we'll be looking back at that game Saturday and saying, you know, that was the big turning point for them. Yeah, most certainly. So he spurs are fifth, it's Aston Villa, who are fourth. I did see a wonderful graphic, though, um, after the, the Brentford game in which my night uh, drew, in which it was the race for the Champions League and, and the uh, the company who put the, the graphic out had the cheek to include Manchester United in that race. Um, <laughs> if Newcastle managed to beat Everton, then I'm sure the next time they put that graphic out, we could be question whether Newcastle might get back into the Champions League, which would be some achievement. I'm joking. I don't think they're going to manage it, unfortunately. Um, and there is a there is a but though, Aaron, isn't there? You know, we're talking about a fantastic win, a fantastic fight back, but there's always a but. Because as you've already alluded to, we sat here after the Wolves game, hoping that the season would reignite. It didn't. And I have to say, if you remove the great comeback, if you remove the fight, you know, some great goals and you look at how United found themselves in the position of 3-1 down, plus the injuries to Jamal LaSalle's potential damage to Livermore, so it's Almiro on to Kraft and so on. There's still a concern for me that this result could be an outlier. You, know, you can't keep defending the way United are. You can't keep conceding the goals by the boatload. You can't keep allowing the opposition midfield the time and space that Newcastle are doing. You know, they're not pressing um, as hard and as quick as they should be. Um, so it, it, it is... A concern, but some might say, do you just accept it? You know, with nine games left, do you just have to accept that Newcastle are more tight at the back? They mm-hmm. will concede goals, but you can best bet your last your last pound that they'll score some too. And do we just say, okay, this is Newcastle United, we've got a few injuries, just accept for the rest of the season and enjoy the ride. I don't know if it's about accepting it, but I think, you know, certainly there is reasons for the fact that they're so leaky. Um, you know, you just got to go back to last season. We always harp on about how um, well Newcastle's backline did last season, joint best defence with Manchester City. But actually, looking back at that, a lot of the fixtures last season, how many times did you have Pope, Trippier, Botman, Cher and Dan Berners at the back five? More often than not, look at this season. You know, you can probably count on one hand the amount of times that's actually been the back five. Now, that's not to excuse it, but I think, you know, you've definitely lost that solidity that the five of them bring and playing there consistently. I think the amount of changes Howe's had to make at the back has been criminal. And I just think now, going into the last nine games, we could be looking, I mean, you know, what is that back four going to be tomorrow night? I mean, to, to put a guess on it, let's just say... Um, worst case scenario, Kieran Trippier isn't back. Tino Livermento also isn't back from that ankle knock. You're probably going to have a back four of Kraft, Cher, Byrne, Lewis Hall. Yeah, I mean, so again, Kraft was substituted off. We we think that was a tactical... That, yeah, that's um, Eddie, Eddie Howe was asked about that in the press conference and said that he wanted more attacking players on the pitch. Um, and funnily enough, when Kraft came off, you saw, saw how go straight over and it looked like he apologised to Kraft for doing it. Um, which, by the way, it was the right decision to bring Emil Kraft off because, you know, he came on, and, and this is no fault of Emil Kraft because he's playing once every two months, but he came on the pitch and, and really was a weak link. Um, so credit to Al for, for having the guts to do it. Um, was it the right decision in the first place to bring him on? Because that was the biggest criticism, wasn't it, 
of, of yeah. the substitutions to begin with that it was Kraft that came on for Jamal LaSalle's who went off injured and in many people say well it should have been Lewis Hall and then you moved down Burn to centre back I mean do you agree with that I mean anyhow kind of admitted he got it wrong anyway and he obviously he's corrected it in time but do you agree with that that, that initial um reaction to that so yeah I, I, I agree that it was the wrong call and and how afterwards came out and said he, he wanted Kraft on because he wanted a little bit more height for West Ham set pieces. Yeah, fair enough, that's a good excuse. But I just think when Dummett, Hall and Kraft were sent down to warm up, you were thinking, right, OK, this is Lewis Hall's time. And when it wasn't, you, you sat there thinking, what does this poor lad have to do um, to get a run? And by the way, Lewis Hall came on and was absolutely fantastic. And if he doesn't start tomorrow night, there's, there's serious questions to be asked of what more he needs to do because he looked really sharp, um, really confident on the ball. He offers a lot going forward. I know Eddie Howe probably you know, doesn't think he's there defensively. You've got to give him a run in this team between now and the end of the season. I'm sorry, he's, he's really earned it. Um, so look, Kraft, he, he's, a, he's a lot more experienced. He can play centre-back. It, it leaves Burn at left-back. I get, I get the sentiment behind it. But for me, I was, I was really hoping that it would be Lewis Hall on in the first half. Yeah, I think it will be Lewis Hall uh, left back against Everton, and I think it'll be Cher and Burn at centre back. And again, you know, I said this in the build up to the game, and I've been saying it for weeks, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who has this uh, train of thought. Damn, Burn looks so much better at centre back. And I know part of him, large part of him, wants to be a, a left back. That's where he feels he can play at. But when you look at what opposition teams do in Newcastle United, it is constantly down their left. Dan Byrne is targeted and they usually get the better of him. Movement of centre-back in the air, he's colossal. He looks much more comfortable. The lack of pace isn't necessarily the biggest weakness anymore because you're alongside you know, another centre-back and you've got maybe people covering you from a centre-midfield point of view. He played really well when he was shifted there and as devastating a blow to lose Lascelles is, I'm quite happy that we're going to Touch wood, hopefully see Byrne at centre back against Everton. Just on that, I just also want to say though, Dan Byrne, I thought did really well at left back in the early stage of that game because I saw that predictable, you know, barrage of tweets pre-game saying, Oh, it's Byrne versus Bowen, you know, it's it's gonna be an absolute massacre. Jared Bowen didn't have an absolute sniff down that right hand side in the first half, um, with Dan Byrne there. So I think I think he does deserve credit, as I do like to give him on this podcast. But I do get your point. I think a centre back pairing of Byrne and shares is the way to go if they touch would stay fit. Um, you've obviously then got Dummett and Kraft who could come in and, and deputise in that position. I mean, Dummett and Kraft, the only time they've partnered each other this season was at Old Trafford and they're absolutely fantastic together. So um you've also then got Jacob Murphy who could who could also fill in at right back. So there's still options, but I think we're so far away from the usual back four, back five. It's scary, um, which does sort of lead to a lot less pressure on the back four, keeping clean sheets. And as long as your Cassie United keeps scoring goals, it isn't a problem, but it's whether they can do that. Obviously, no Gordon tomorrow night, which is a, a big blow. Um, very limited options in terms of who can actually come on as well. So, um, yeah, I think I think Burn and Cher will be the, the centre-back partnership. I'm hoping it's Lewis Hall at left-back. And then I, I don't really have a preference as to, as to who plays out on the right. We might see even Jacob Murphy fill in there if indeed Miguel Mimon's past fit. But Kieran Trippier was was there on Saturday. You know, I saw him walking into the the, the tunnel. He wasn't included in the squad. And Eddie Howe has said, you know, there's a, there's a chance he might be involved against Everton. So we'll wait and see. And Newcastle might be forced to uh, to play him. We'll talk now about Jamal Lasalle's injury. Oh, goodness me, another ACL. I mean, you know. At the start of the season, Aaron, in your club of ACL injuries, it was just you and you alone. Now you're going to have to make extra room because not only have you got Sven Botman in there, you've now got Jamal LaSalle joining you for a coffee or two. Yeah, um, it was just... Uh, yeah, I'm was... just going to say, I'm devastated from him. Absolutely devastated from him. You know, people on this podcast know I'm a huge fan of Jamal LaSalle. I'm, I'm really happy that he's going to stay an extra year. And I got a lot of, um, shall we say, negative feedback when I suggested in the summer that he should, he should stay. Um, and I've, I've, you know, stuck to that line and, and I've had a lot of um, negative responses to that. And now those same people jumping on saying, oh, well, doesn't this extension look clever? It's, well, you, you can't predict an ACL. You can't predict a nine-month injury. You know, at the time of him getting this injury, 
the logic made perfect at this getting this contract. The, the logic made perfect sense. You know, you stopped them leaving on the cheap, certainly on a free this summer, while also having a more than capable centre back to turn to when needed. Now, of course, what's happened on Saturday changes the circumstances. Um, but a massive blow, and you knew, didn't you, Aaron, as soon as the hand went up in the air that he was done for? You knew as soon as he hit the ground that he was done for. And, and then we had this farcical thing yet again of players still trying to play on. And I get it, it's courageous. But you could tell, you could tell instantly when he stood up, you could hardly walk. Ne never mind run. And, and yeah, it, the, 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 need, the need, something needs to, to happen here, you know. Either someone has to stand up to the players and say you're not going back on. Yeah. Because you're right. Absolutely. That's the question I think everyone's asking. Why did he go back on the pitch? Because okay, he was on your arm. What was it? Three or four minutes. But as someone who's had an ACL, I mean, you can barely walk. That yeah. The more damage. You, you knew straight away when he went down that it was bad, and then you know you you saw him trying to sort of warm up on the sidelines, and he thought surely somebody's just going to have the the word with him and say you need to come off here. And I get he's the captain. You know, he wants to play on fair play, but it was absolutely obvious. And I think, um, I mean, you've just said there you can't predict an ACL injury. I think with Newcastle's look this season, we probably can predict that there's going to be a couple more between now and the end of the season. I mean, to have him and Botman, you know, brought down by the same injury, which, you know, can really, really alter a player's career. I mean, for Jamal Lascelles at that age, you know, it's an absolute hammer blow. Botman's got time to obviously come back and recover. Um, it's really, really worrying. And, and I think, look, we, we were talking last week when Botman obviously went under the knife about the importance of a, of a central defender. You know, the fact that both Botman and the Cells now might be out until the end of 2024, I think it's an absolute no-brainer now that, you know, that position is the absolute priority in the summer. Um, devastated for him. He's been very, very good this season. He's came in. I think he was deserving of the extension, as, as you said. Um and yeah, look, it's just happened at the most inopportune time as well. Because he would have had a chance to start in that first team come next season. I know we're talking about buying a new centre back in and you know someone to replace Botman, but as you've just said there, he's been superb this season. I mean, the first time around when he replaced Botman, he put in seven or eight fantastic performances. You know, games against the likes of PSG, etc. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he's a very good centre back, in my opinion. I think he would have hopefully my hope was he'd finish the season strongly, go into pre-season. Yes, they might spend 15, 20 million at the very least on a centre back, but he would have been given a fair chance to say anyhow, look, I can still be your 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 other um centre back in the in, in the, the back four pair in there. And you know, he's been been dealt this horrendous blow. And it does lead us on to the question of what they do. In the summer, you've just said there it has to be a, a priority. And I think for me, Aaron, the big thing is, is that I think for some, there's this very misguided expectation of what Newcastle United will be able to do in the summer in terms of the transfer market. You know, the amount of folk who kicked off when LaSalle signed that extension and they were putting out lists of nine or ten current first-team players who need to be on their way in the summer... Like it's absolutely amazing. Newcastle United are not going to have an endless budget to spend this summer. They're already going to have to be really clever, potentially sell a big name to raise funds. And this is before Lascelles gets injured. This is before Botman gets injured. And now the budget, which was probably already going to be stretched, then Botman gets injured, it's going to be stretched further. And now you've lost Lascelles. They're going to have to dance through some obstacles to make that budget uh, work for them in the summer. Yeah, they are. And I think it, it's not just, well, worryingly, in terms of the conversation we're having, it, it's not just centre-back that needs upgraded. I think um, anybody who has listened to any podcast that you've done for the last year knows that you want a, a striker. Um, right midfield, people will want another central midfielder, left-back to upgrade Burn. There's, there's a whole list of you know positions that, that fans want upgraded. Um, and it begs that question again of, of do we see that big name exit this summer to facilitate, you know, a really, really big revamp? Now, there's an argument to suggest that in an ideal world, Newcastle, you know, if they had a, a, an endless pot of money, need a, a good couple of defenders. You know, Jamal Asenza is fantastic, but he's getting no younger. Um, he's a squad player at best. I don't think, you know, there's any anybody calling for him to 
be an absolute regular first teamer. There's an argument that suggests that you need two new centre backs in to really get Newcastle to that next level of being Champions League quality every single year. You know, we're now, yes, I know injuries are obviously the the reason for this, but we're now talking about Kraft and Dummett being the the backup centre halves. You know, you need youngsters coming through, and you need you know a little bit more quality in that position, which I hope they do. Um, Gary makes a good point in the in the comments here that you know Lloyd Kelly is free this summer, um, and there's been a lot of talk about Newcastle United going out and getting him. Um, Eddie Howe knows him very well from his time down at Bournemouth. Um, you know, not so long ago, he's been linked with likes of Spurs and Arsenal for 20 million. I think it would be a good deal. And maybe that's the way Newcastle go. Lloyd Kelly on a free, but they also go out and spend 30, 40 million on a real first teamer who eventually will be the long-term partner of Sven Botman. Big summer for Alex Murphy coming up, you expect as well, because he's going to have a, a good chance to stake his own claim. Um, El Corvo in the comments says, can't agree with all this hype ball around the cells. He's not good enough. The team need centre-backs um, who are good on the ball to go to the next level. Um, I mean, just to clarify my my point on on the cells is the fact that you know the him, him being fit, him staying, allows Newcastle to spend 20, 25 million on a first-choice centre-back and then not have to really worry about backup because you had someone of LaSalle's quality who I think could be in the first team for for most of the bottom half Premier League clubs at the very least. But now with that injury, you're right, they're going to have to go out and, and, and possibly spend a lot of money on, on, on two centre-backs, which removes vital funds for elsewhere on, on the pitch. As you mentioned, you know, a winger, a left-back, a striker, a centre-midfielder. There's so many positions which need to be uh, addressed and they're not going to have the money to do so. Um, other comments, um, Gary says, Dan Byrne is a big asset defending set pieces. I agree. Play him at centre-back. Arneson uh, has called us something a little bit rude. Move and prepare for Thursday's game. Well, I'm sorry, Arneson. Castle haven't got a game on Thursday, so I don't know what you're talking about, buddy. Um, Paul says, the last three subs must start. The team was so much more aggressive around those changes. Sam says Hall, Anderson, and Barnes absolutely superb off the bench. Kraft and Murphy were disastrous on the right hand side. Murphy much better at right back when we were in the ascendancy. So we could see, I think, Murphy at right back if Trippier isn't back in time. Right on to the next point there. We've discussed the Sales' injury. Let us know in the comments what you think about that. Um, I mean, we also just quickly address Livermento and Miggy going off with injuries. I mean, Miggy was on for all of what, seven minutes, if that. You just couldn't write it, could you? I mean, I know a lot of people get angry at him when we say, oh, bad luck this season with injuries. But, I mean, you look at LaSalle's injury, nothing in it, you know, just goes down. Livermento, again, nothing nothing really in it. Uh, Miggy, I'm not even sure what happened. It, it just seems to be they're picking up these injuries in which is no contact. And, it's, the, you know, the, the, then having a, a massive layoff. Yeah, I mean, Miggy Almiron, I think, it came off injured after crossing the ball. Uh, Tino Livermento took a, a ball to the ankle, um, which obviously it was the same issue that kept him out of the international break. Just really freak injuries that, you know, are, are just, I mean, you know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. I mean, I've just done a, wrote a piece this morning about Newcastle's injuries and there's 40 separate issues that they've had this season, 40 separate injuries. And that's not thrown in a lengthy band to their to their summer signing as well, uh, to just add to the misery. So, I mean, it, it, it is really ridiculous. I think, you know, it's right that there's going to be a, a real inquest about what's been going on in the physio room at the end of the season to really get to the bottom of, of um, what's been happening. And I think, um, you know, it's absolutely no surprise to see that they brought someone like Johnny King in from Leicester for some fresh blood and fresh eyes to, to you know, to run the rule over the, the physio department because, um, you know, it, it really is baffling of, of, of what's happened this season. But it is fair to say that, because I mean, a lot of people are asking, do you think it's it's down to the way Newcastle United train and play? Do you think it's, it is down to bad luck? But in a lot of these injuries that they have had have been freak injuries, haven't they? You know, the... Um, the injury to Harvey Barnes against Sheffield United, for example, you know, you just you, you couldn't make that up. I mean, it's like an injury no one's ever heard of. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Eddie Howe was it was put how again and how on Saturday sort of tried to deflect and say that look, you know, the game in general is getting quicker, the way we play is very quick and high intensity and pressing, and you know, the way we train is of a similar nature. You know, you can also throw in the fact that um 
they've had Europe, they weren't used to it. None of these players were really used to playing three games before a week before um, October, November. Still, you know, all of these excuses don't, you know, account for the fact that we've had 40 separate injuries this season. I mean, that is that is the, you know, you, some clubs won't even get that across three separate seasons. So, um, I think that there definitely needs to be questions asked about, you know, what's been going on behind the scenes, about what they're doing in training, um, and hopefully they can get to the bottom of, you know, what's been sort of added to these these injuries. Yeah, Gary says Barnes, Byrne, Anderson, all freak injuries, as well as the, the uh, shoulder dislocations we've had. Murphy was uh, one of them. Peter says, off topic, but is Dan Ashworth staying after report today? Peter, I would check your calendar because it is April the 1st, and I think you've been had there by the infamous uh, Frank Chipper on social media. Uh, Carl says on Twitter, because I did ask for a few people to um, send any questions in the had for, for, for myself and Aaron. And Carl says, do you think the club's injury record this season would put off any potential income comings in the summer? I, I saw that question. And I, if I'm honest, no, I, I don't I don't think so. Um, look, I don't, I don't think players are going to be looking at this club and thinking, oh, if I go there, you know, I'm going to get struck down with the Newcastle injury case. I think it's certainly a worry, but I don't know whether it's 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 going to be enough to to put players off. Uh, Kieran says, "Do you think that comeback will be a good push turning point for the rest of the season after coming close to a comeback a few times, but not getting all three points to get all three in such a big game? Surely has to push the team on to finish in the top six or seven. Well, where's he been the last couple of months when we've been talking about this exact issue? We know." That there's, you know, this is this should on paper be the catalyst to, to start the season, to light the the touch paper, but this is Newcastle United in 23-24. We just don't know whether it'll be a another uh, another false storm. Um Andre says, uh, do you think it is time for some different voices in the back room? Uh, in terms of the staff, he he says, do you think Eddie has too many like-minded coaches around him who just agree with him and don't question? I guess he's maybe talking about the subs that were made, um, the initial subs that were made yesterday. Uh, sorry, on Saturday. Um, uh, as for the subs that he made Saturday, one, I think how deserves credit for how early he made them. There was no waiting around for the 60, 65th minute. It was done pretty much three or four minutes after um Jared Bowen scored the third goal. And also, I mean, just going off Saturday alone, what, what else could Howe have done? He's got absolutely no options. You know, he's got no Callum Wilson to call on, no Joel Linton, no um, Sandro Tonali. He's, he's got he's got no one. You knew that the subs were going to be Anderson Hall and Miggy at some point. Um, at times, it did look a little bit disjointed when all these players came on. He didn't really know where everyone was playing for the good you know, the first five, ten minutes of, of those subs. But once they found the rhythm, it was better. Um, in terms of, you know, maybe new blood, I think definitely you've got a lot of coaches who are still there under the, you know, the previous regime. And a lot of coaches who have been with Howe for a lot of years, uh, you know, like to say, Weatherstone, you've obviously got Graham Jones, who who has held on from, from the Bruce era. I don't see why, you know, why it would be a bad thing for a, a bit of fresh blood, no. Um, ben says, do you think we should be looking at state-of-the-art facility now and not in 10 years if we want to be elite? In terms of the training grounds, because um, he questions whether that might be um, a small factor in the injuries that Newcastle have picked up. You know, There's a time now, you know, that they've, made, they've put a lot of money and investment in the training ground, they've improved it, it looks so much better than it ever did under Mike Ashley. But Ben's saying, is it now time to actually jump ahead a few years and and, and buy a site and build it a brand new, Leicester City-esque kind of uh, training ground? I mean, maybe, but, you know, it, this isn't, you know, an ideal world where money's no object. This is a, you know, as you're saying, I mean, Leicester, million, Leicester spent, I think, £500 million on their entire training complex. It's not a cheap thing to do to build a state-of-the-art thing. I think it's definitely promising that they are looking to eventually move. But, They've made some absolutely fantastic upgrades to Benton, and I know it's not you know where they want to be long term, but compared to what it was two years ago or three years ago when the title happened, it's absolute night and day. You know they really have dragged that training ground from what was it described as a League One or a League Two, you know, standing training ground to 
to Premier League quality. They've, they've really made some top changes to it. Um, so look at you know how quickly you can fast forward these projects that are going to take years anyway, aren't they? You know you're not going to be able to move into a new training ground next week anyway. So it sort of feels like a you know a, a pointless conversation anyway. Hmm. They've got to find the site first and go through all yeah. of the planning and what have you. So like I said, it's not an overnight solution. It's not even a, a year to two year solution. It is going to take time. And what I'd say there, Ben, is kind of just trust the process. You know, it's the same with St. James's Park. We know at some point changes are going to happen. Hopefully, probably an extension of some sort, an expansion. But again, that's in the future. And there's a plan, there's a process, and just and just trust what those at the top are doing, and be be assured that they're having the very best people involved in making these decisions. Um, John says, would you agree that Newcastle Newcastle's left side looked the strongest when Hall, Anderson, and Barnes were on, and should that remain the way going into the Everton game? Um, yeah, look, I think that left side looked really good. I think that um, Hall and Arneson coming on, I, think, I know everybody's been talking about Hall, but I think Arneson's performance sort of went under the radar a little, a little bit. I think he actually did more than Longstaff and Willick during his little cameo than those two did in the entire game. I thought he was really good. He keeps the ball so well um, in the final third. They look really, really good. And I think, I mean, look... Given that we know Sean Longstaff is is running on absolute empty and playing through the pain, and the fact that Joe Willock is obviously you know getting up to full speed and he has been for a couple of weeks, I don't see why you don't you know throw Anderson in, throw Lewis Hall in from the start. We, we've talked about all these injuries, and I think a lot of them have been the you know the contributing factors to these have been the lack of rotation. Eddie Howe has stuck to those favourites all season. Um, at times because he hasn't had any options, but now he's got a couple of options, you know. He's got Lewis Hall to come in at left back. He's got Elliot Anderson to come in. Harvey Barnes, you know, will have to come in and replace uh, Anthony Gordon, who's suspended. For me, I think I would be very tempted to start all three of them. Um, I'll tell you what, let, let, let's, let's do our team because, I mean, there's so few options. I think, you know, the team probably does pick itself. I think you've got to go to Bravka in there. And I mean... Was was I mean I just want to jump in there. Dubravka in net. The other option would be Lois Carriers. John has asked another question and he said, Do you think Dubravka should have done better for the Antonio goal? A lot of people have said, despite the victory, despite the win, despite the comeback, one of the glaring yeah. uh, things that shone through and uh we didn't really shone, but um was was Dubravka and it, people are, are, are criticizing him more and more. Should he have done better for the for the goal? I think he should have done better for Antonio's and I, and I think he should have done better for the second. I think for a lot of Premier League goalkeepers, that's a routine save. Um, he's got to make himself more commanding of that area. He's got to make it harder for these players to shoot. He just, you know, he, he doesn't come out. He doesn't really make himself look big. He, you don't really have that confidence that he's going to come out and save it. Whereas Nick Pope, you always sort of thought when a, a striker was running through on goal, there's a good chance that Pope stops this. Um yeah, look, I think he, he made some good saves, but I think you know we what we've seen in the last couple of months is that Dubravka's time as a Premier League number one out and out, week in, week out, I think is is coming to a, a really, really swift end. Um and, and I would agree with whoever whoever sent that tweet in questioning that I think it was it was glaringly obvious on Saturday that a couple of those goals I think wouldn't have went in with other goalkeepers in net. I guess so. Some would argue, well, not every keeper is good at coming off the line. But then, what you'd have to say to that is, if if you're not confident at coming off the line and smothering the ball like Nick Pope is, and you have to make sure that you're better in in the shot, the the I can't say it, shot stopping element of your game. And of late, Martin Dubravka isn't quite there. You know, fantastic against Blackburn, probably his best performance since replacing uh, Nick Pope. But yeah, again, probably should have done better. Uh, against West Ham, but Martin Dubravka in net against Everton. Kevin Tripp yet a start if he's fit, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if Tripp is fit, then it's a no brainer. He was very, very close to making that squad on, on Saturday against West Ham. So he goes in. If, if Tripp isn't fit, then do we go Kraft? Do we go Murphy? I would go Jacob Murphy if Miguel Almiron is fit. So okay. again, it's another question mark. Okay. If, if everyone is fit, yeah, for me, it'd be Kieran Trippier and then Murphy 
uh, ahead of him. But um, if not, Murphy, I think, could do a really good job filling in at right back ahead of Kraft. Then it's got to be Cher, got to be Byrne, got to be Lewis oh. Hall. Um, and actually, at this point, I would usually say that's what we would do. It's not what Eddie Howe is going to do, but actually he doesn't have any options. He has to really do that, and, unless he's playing Paul Dummett. But I think he probably will play Byrne alongside Cher and Lewis Hall at left back. Like you say, Murphy for me. Um, if Trippi has fit right back into the middle, uh, Bruno, Willick and Arneson. But I do think he'll probably start Sean Longstaff ahead of Elliot Arneson. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and Sean, you know, he needs a goal. That that one, that sitter he missed on Saturday, thankfully it didn't cost Newcastle in the end. But he just doesn't look happy. He doesn't look comfortable. He doesn't. He, he's lacking belief, and he really needs a good performance. I think to to get the critics off his back. And and look, if you're criticising his play, I think I think that's fully justified because he hasn't been up to standard. Um, and I think a good performance against Everton is what's needed. Left wing. It's got to be Harvey Barnes, and we're going to talk about him in a second. We've we've kept the the best till till last mm. um, because what a what a, a, a match winning performance from Harvey Barnes. Then up top, um, Alexander Isaac. But before we get on to Harvey Barnes, there is one other question I want to put to you, Aaron. It's not really a question; it's more of a statement that someone sent me it's from Craig on social media. And he says, a full and frank apology to the audience is required about Calvin Phillips. And for our listeners and viewers who don't maybe remember, I can take you back to countless episodes throughout December and January where Aaron was all but having me up against the wall because I didn't want Calvin Phillips at Manchester City. I'm sure on many occasions you described it is a no-brainer that Newcastle should sign Calvin Phillips on loan. In January, and I said, No, how can you expect a man who's barely played any football to be match fit? Good player, but just not up to scratch, and can't even get a game for West Ham. And when he does, he's all at sea. He's then swearing at the fans who give him abuse on the way out. Aaron, have you got anything to say? Have you got an apology to deliver? I'm really sorry, Mudge. The last two minutes there, you just completely cut out. I didn't really hear what you what you said, so I, I think we should maybe just swiftly move on there to the next topic. No, look, Calvin Phillips. Um, when he when he came on the pitch on Saturday, I think he came on two minutes after Harvey Barnes, and I don't think you could have had two different cameo appearances: one uh, scoring the winning goal, and one. I mean, he just looks absolutely dreadful, doesn't he? And I think. You know, it's been said a lot of times the last couple of weeks, he's the only player to get a loan move and somehow lose his international place. Uh, he, he just looks all at sea. It looks like a horrendous move for him. He just looks well off the pace. He looked well off the pace for the, for the winning goal as well, where Barnes goes past him like he wasn't there. Um, and look, you know what they say, even a, even a broken clock's right <laughs> twice a day. So congratulations on the on the call for Calvin Phillips. It was the, It was the right choice. Do you know, right, it's a good job you've learned your lesson from that Jacob Murphy Nando's bet because if we had a bet every time I went up against you, Aaron, I'd be having Nando's four or five times a week because I'm often right. I don't know if I'm often right. I think you're just often wrong. I don't know how you ever saw Calvin Phillips as the right option, even with all his injuries. Because I had faith that Eddie Howe was, you know, the great man, manager, great tactician, great armour on the shoulder gaffer that he is, would be able to get a tune out of this England international at the time. Um, but as Brian Kelly rightly says in the comments here, that is why Aaron is a journalist and not a manager. <laughs> David Moyes is the head of the Calvin Phillips fan club. If you read all the statements when he signed, he tried to sign him twice and there's only one club I was going to go to. And David Moyes doesn't even bother playing him. I mean, when he came on, Calvin Phillips, bless him. I know someone's chopped up the, the highlights, the, the, the nightmare, shall we say, the nightmare reel. He just needs a Benny Hill theme tune over it. I mean, that's how bad it was. And you do feel sorry for him to a degree. Um, you know, he looks like he's running through treacle. Concedes that penalty, doesn't he? Uh, was it a penalty for you, Aaron? It was a penalty for me. Um, and I, I, I'm struggling to understand how so many people are sort of using the excuse that Gordon puts his leg in front. Well, of course he does. He's being clever. He wins the penalty. I think both of them were penalties for me. And that's not 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 me speaking through bias. Um, and I also think anybody um, calling for West Ham's second goal to be chalked off because of Fabian Cher going down needs to have a really uh, long look at themselves because there's no way that goal 
should have been disallowed. Um, but yeah, I, th- I thought both of them were penalties for me. Interesting. I mean, I was look, w- watching them back. I can see why maybe some people are kind of put out, especially if you're West Ham uh, support. I think if it was on the other foot, you might be a little bit miffed to be a Newcastle United fan. But uh, you, you know, we'll take VAR running in our favour. But yeah, difficult afternoon for Calvin Phillips. I didn't quite hear an apology to our listeners or, or viewers, though, Aaron. Is that coming or is, what's happening there? Look, you know, even even someone like me who gets stuff right all the time gets has rare off days. I'm, I'm sure there won't be too many more in the future. Grand. We'll not mention Scott McTominay. Um, <laughs> right. We're going to talk about Harvey Barnes because he has also been a man who has had a lot of stick, a lot of questions about his price tag. Um, you know, he's missed more games of this season in his first season at Newcastle than he did in his last four at Leicester City. And I always had faith that once he got over that injury that he got dealt at Sheffield United, he would he would come good. And obviously it hasn't been an easy road to uh recovery. People around that Chelsea game a few weeks back again were starting to question the move, question the price tag. But he silenced his doubters with two great goals against West Ham, hasn't he? Looked really, really good Saturday. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of those comments that were probably, you know, aimed his way on social media was after that disastrous Blackburn appearance where um, he obviously missed that penalty, he missed the sitter, looked like a different player Saturday. The, the run for the third goal is absolutely fantastic. The finish uh, for the fourth goal is even better. You just hope now that this is the this is the springboard. I know I keep talking about it, but this is hopefully the... The, you know, the, the game that he needed, he needs an uninterrupted run of, of matches between now and the end of the season. Um, he looks absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, for, for those people who are still clinging on to the notion that Alan St. Maxim shouldn't have been sold, Harvey Barnes has now scored a third of Alan St. Maxim's Premier League goals um, in 12 appearances. And it took Maxi four seasons uh, to get 12 goals. And Barnes is already on four. So, he looks fantastic, um, and and this is what Newcastle signed him for. The you know the goals and assists that he brings. He's not a you know a, you know a player with flair who's going to do tricks and get fans off their seats. But he's a really really consistent finisher. He's really really lethal in the final third, uh, and we saw that with two moments of real brilliance on Saturday. He's got the end product that Anson Maxman very rarely had, and there's still some people saying you know we should never replaced St. Maxman with Harvey Barnes, but a big fan of Harvey Barnes. I mean, him above anybody else will know that he's not played enough games this season and he'll be frustrated more than anyone else about it. He doesn't need questions raised about his ability or price tag. He'll be well aware that that's hanging over his head. But from what I'd seen from him in the brief moments we've seen of him this season, I've been impressed because he's so quick and he's so sharp. You know, you know, he's quick in in body and in mind. It's just you know, it's it's it's, it's one two. So they're done, and he's 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 a real quality player, and I, and I think he's going to prove to be worth every single penny of this thirty eight million pounds plus that they paid for him. He's a solid Premier League player. You've mentioned his record there, and with a, a good run of games, no more injuries, he's going to be a key component in Newcastle United in the seasons to come. Well, we'll just going back to what you said uh, um, when you when you started bringing up Barnes. Before this season, he very rarely missed games. He was very consistent. His injury record was absolutely fantastic at Leicester. You know, he has that really freak injury at the start of the season, which has obviously derailed his first his first year at Newcastle. Um, keep him fit. You know, hopefully he can get through to the end of the season, have a good summer with the team. And it might be a case of what we saw with Gordon, where he just needs that time to bed in. He needs that run of games. He needs a summer working with Howe um, to get up to full speed and hopefully touch wood. You know we're going to be seeing a lot more of them, and, and I think you know between now and between now and uh, mid-May, hopefully we're getting a you know a good run of games in them. Uh, Gary says Barnes is direct, none of that tippy tappy rubbish with step overs. Why I man says, do you not think Barnes is better impact from the bench? And I, I get the point that he's making there, but the, the fact being, Eddie Howe has very limited options. So even if Eddie Howe didn't want to start him on Tuesday against Everton, really, the injuries that he's dealing with, he kind of has nowhere else to turn, doesn't he? 
Long long term, though, this is the question of, you know, what does he do with, with Barnes? What does he do with Gordon? Because in an ideal world, when you've got everyone back fit, you know, I don't think anybody at the moment is picking Barnes over Gordon on that left-hand side. Do you move Gordon to the right? And is he maybe the long-term replacement for Miggy? Do you move Barnes out to the right? I mean, he's very rarely played there for Leicester anyway. Um, you know, there is a, you know, a question to be asked much further down the road as to whether you know, having these two fantastic wingers is, is actually a, 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 you know, a curse for one of them. Um, but look, I mean, certainly for Everton, he starts, certainly hopefully for the next couple of games, we'll see a lot more minutes in him um, and hopefully he stays fit. Yeah, I think you probably play him on the left and switch Gordon over to the right when fit. We've mentioned there briefly the, the two goals, but the first goal he scored to hold his run the way he does, absolutely fantastic, lovely ball through the middle and a superb finish to, to put it through the legs of Fabianski. And then the second goal, and this is what I'm talking about, he's so quick and so sharp, opens his body up, bang, into the corner. You know, Other players take a touch to maybe look for a pass, but he, he doesn't actually even look where the goal is. He just instinctively knows where he's putting that. It's a superb finish, fantastic way to win the game. And, just describe your emotions when that ball hit the back of the net. Um, relief, joy. I mean, it, it was just absolutely fantastic, wasn't it? But you got you got that feeling, didn't you, when it was 3-2 and the penalty went in, at least I did, that you thought, OK, the, the, this might be on here. The crowd picked up, the atmosphere suddenly took a lift. Um, and it was one of those where when Gordon holds the ball up, knocks it off to Barnes for the fourth goal, you know, he beats... Um, a certain West Ham midfielder, and then absolutely rallies it in. He sort of knew it was going to fly in the net. It was just one of those end of the games where you could see it coming. Um, delighted for him personally, you know, delighted to see that he's coming back and not only getting minutes, but really improving and impressing so much better than when he came off the bench at Blackburn. Um, so, yeah, delighted for him after what's been a really, really tough year. Uh, yeah, more to come, hopefully. Yeah. Why I Man says, don't think Gordon is anywhere near the player on the right for me. It's certainly going to be interesting to see how Eddie Howe fits both men into the team. We've got plenty of people out and asking in the comments, uh, what do we think will happen in the summer? We've got one person asking, um, who do we think Newcastle will sign first in the summer? Oh, um, let's I, think Lo- I think Lloyd Kelly's the future will be uh, sorted rather quickly. We know they like him, they've watched him. You've mentioned there the relationship between him and Eddie Howe. Um, if Newcastle now you can shore that one up and they've got a heck of a lot of competition about it, maybe the injuries to LaSalle and Botman will force the issue somewhat. I could see that one possibly being the first signing over the line. Yeah, and, and I've seen a lot of people turn their nose up to, to Kelly and, and their reasoning for it is, you know, where... When you cast United with all this money and all this ambition of being a top club and all this, but you know why are we going for for Bournemouth players? But actually, you know, look at some of the players we've signed from teams around that uh, part of the league before: Anthony Gordon from Everton, Harvey Barnes from Leicester. There's absolutely nothing against going and getting these players from from the bottom half of the Premier League. And I think, as we've talked about with Newcastle's and and everybody's budget restrictions this summer. Going out and getting a player of Kelly's quality for nothing, apart from the wages he's going to cost you and a little signing on fee, it's an absolute uh, it's an absolute no brainer for me. I think it would be a really really good deal. Um, we know that they've been looking around Portugal for some defenders. I mean, I think it was that comment there by Sean who mentions Diamande, who obviously plays for Lisbon, very very uh, talented player. But again, there'll be um, competition for him. I think it, it, for me, I think a centre back needs to be a priority, um, and, and hopefully that's the deal to get done first. Mm, yeah, I think he probably will be at the priority given the injuries. And you are right; we've already had comments um, regarding two other Bournemouth players who I think we are fans of Aaron, and that's Lonke and Billin. Fools, we know, is not a big fan, and uh, she has said, "Please." not uh, those two in the summer. But as long as scoring again on Saturday for Bournemouth, you know, he's a, he's he's finding his form and maybe this is the start of him being prolific in the Premier League. I mean, he's going to cost it a fair whack. We know where he has a big fan. Could we see him being the striker in Newcastle are looking to sign in the summer, do you think? Look, maybe. I, I really, really like Solanke as a player. I don't think this season's just a flash of the pan. I generally do think we are seeing him emerge as a a regular, consistent Premier League scorer. The only issue that I've got um, 
is the money that it would probably cost to get him away from Bournemouth. They really don't want to lose him. And I just think, could a really big amount of, of you know, let's just say it's around 50 million, could that money be spelt, spent elsewhere? Could it be spent on someone with a bit more pedigree, maybe? So that would be my only real downside to, to sign in Solanke. Billin, I really like. He, he sort of lost his way in this Bournemouth team under Iriola. Um, He wouldn't cost anywhere near as much. But would he fit into this system considering he's been playing in a 10? I don't know. So um, two players that are really talented. I think if they if they came in, they would improve this squad. But, you know, there's, I think there's question marks about both of them. Hmm. I think it's about getting the balance of getting those players in who can instantly improve the first team and then also building a squad and doing it, as we say, within the budget and acting clever. So there's free transfers to be had or players who want necessarily first team for, for their current, first choice for their current teams. It's about going and trying to maybe get a little bit of a, a, a bargain there. Gary says Kelly would be a good sign for me if we can get him over the line with the wages we'll have off the books this summer. It would be a great deal. Um, On to Everton then. Aaron, um, not doing very well at the moment, haven't picked up a win since Christmas and currently Sean Dyche has equaled Everton's longest winless winless run. So, hello Newcastle United! No, I'm joking, you know, Newcastle United are surely going to get uh, a win on Tuesday and you know, I, my fear was if they lost to West Ham, even if they drew to West Ham, Everton would rock up and you know take advantage. We know Everton did really well against them in the the, the, the first fixture down at Goodison Park. The tactics were spot on, but this is set up surely for Newcastle United to, to get their third win on the bounce at home. On paper, this is you know a, a home and hose, cut and dry. Three points for Newcastle United. They've had that fantastic comeback. The atmosphere will be fantastic from minute one on Tuesday. They're against one of the you know the worst form teams of the league. But as you say, this is Newcastle United of 23-24. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know whether they're going to, you know, let us down again. We don't know whether Eddie Howe will have 11 fit players to put out on the on the pitch. But you'd be really, really disappointed if Newcastle don't manage to pick up three points on Tuesday. Whatever the, you know, the circumstances around it, you'd be really gutted if they can't get off the line um, because it looks like a really favourable draw for them after a, a huge win on Saturday. I mean, how big of a loss is Anthony Gordon going to be? You know, wins two penalties. He was a nuisance all day uh, for West Ham. He obviously then gets sent off, but he also gets the assist, doesn't he, as well, um, for one of the other goals. He's going to be a big miss, but is it potentially a blessing in, in disguise? I mean, I've seen that said. I've, I've heard that being said. He's not the Anthony Gordon of old, though. He doesn't seem to have that ability to be wound up as... as Newcastle United managed to do when he was playing for Everton and Cher and Trippier got the better of him. And I'm not necessarily worried about him facing Everton and, and the crowd getting on his back, the, you know, the, the travelling fans and, and, and winding him up. I think he'd handle it perfectly. Um, not like their goalkeeper, he seems to be wound up quite easily. Um, so I wasn't worried about that. So, I I mean, it's it's a big loss, isn't he? Because he's really been the shining light through the, the dark years of December and January. I don't think um, it's a blessing in disguise by any means. I don't think, you know, having their most potent attacking player of the last three weeks out injured is, is a, you know, a boost for them. I thought he was um, Newcastle's best asset going forward. I know we haven't really talked about him, but I thought him and Isaac were both really, really good on Saturday. Isaac without the ball was fantastic. Um, and Gordon, just every time he picks the ball up these days, he really looks like he's going to go and do something with it. Uh, fantastic for the two penalties. It's a real shame because, you know, I think he would have been really up for, for tomorrow night's game. He would have been really hoping to, you know, show Everton, you know, what he can do now after leaving under a cloud. He's playing out of his skin. I think the only blessing to come out of it is that at a time where he's played a lot of games, overcome a few, you know, minor niggles in terms of injuries, at least where, you know, wrapping him up in cotton wool and he's definitely going to be out there uh, this weekend. I just want to read you some thoughts from um, Sean Dyche ahead of Tuesday. He says, we have to make sure the details are correct. We haven't been doing that. And it's quite obvious in both boxes. That's what has to certainly be intact when you go to places like St. James's Park. We don't need a reaction sense of the effort. It's the details. Slightly less so against Bournemouth with the creation of chances, but genuinely it's all there for us to build on, but you can't make mistakes at both ends, by the way. It's not fair to question a defensive moment because we had a chance after chance we haven't capitalised on. 
So we have to change both ends on the pitch. Um, yeah, Newcastle have had a great result and they're a good outfit. We know that. We did a really good job tactically and with the delivery of the performance against them early in the season. We, But we can't rely on that. But it's a good marker that it's achievable to take these games on. It's no easy task. We've got a pretty experienced group. Few uh, are learning as they go, but we expect to go there and deliver a performance. We've had a knock ourselves, and now it's about correcting that. It's fair to say that if there was maybe more, I don't know what the right word is, representation at the top of Everton, maybe, you know, Sean Dyche might severely be on the ropes. You know, no wins since Christmas. This would be maybe a game that he has to win to save his career, but it's not his career, his job, sorry. He doesn't seem to have that pressure, but he's certainly, you know, he's pointing out defensively and up top, things aren't great. So another nod to, to Newcastle, and, and you know, he's, he's pretty much said this is how you take advantage over here. Yeah, look, I think there'll be two things that he's saying to this Everton team, or, or a couple really, he'd be saying, look what we did with them in the return leg at Goodison. He'd be saying, look how leaky this Newcastle defence is. Let's make sure, you know, to the likes of Calvert-Lewin and Takura and Dwight McNeil and Harrison, let's make sure we're really punishing them. What's going to be a, um, a second string defence out there? And also, you know, um, he'll have seen what West Ham did for an hour on Saturday and, and how they took advantage and how they... You know, went to a really tough ground and, and had a two goal lead. So there's there's reasons to be optimistic. I mean, on Dice as well. I don't think you know the the situation around Everton at the minute and the um, the deductions and the restrictions. I think you know Dice is actually working miracles to actually have them you know out of the relegation zone. Um, but yeah, as we said, you know, you'd be really good if Newcastle don't manage to get a win on Tuesday. Yeah, um, and a few Everton fans. Uh, this is from the BBC Sport website reacting to the defeat to Bournemouth on Saturday. Bournemouth were there for the taking and our lack of pace, creativity and bravery meant we couldn't take advantage of this. We are sleepwalking our way to relegation. Another one says, very worrying times as the, as the team is really struggling, never looks like to score. Defence all of a sudden looking very shaky and where once we could rely on clean sheets, that is no longer the case. If it wasn't for poorer teams in the league, we would be even in even deeper trouble. I'm struggling to see where our next win comes from. So they're not confident at all. Newcastle United can be confident that they can get the job done from, from their side of things because, well, you know, they came back from West Ham. Attacking-wise, they look good. Yes, they've got to show up defensively, but, you know, surely we've got to be positive they can get all three points here. I mean, it's just written for one eleven and now, isn't it? After isn't all it? those yeah. fan comments. No, look, you do have to be positive. And um, tomorrow night should be a really, really good atmosphere at St James Park. I thought it was a little bit flat during the first half on Saturday. I thought, obviously, when the goal, the third goal went in for West Ham, it was really, really flat and looked on like it was going to be one of those afternoons. But the last half an hour is how it should be, where it really picks up and the fans and the team are one. Um so hopefully tomorrow night, you know, we get that from the start and Newcastle can just kick on, get Evan out of the way and get this uh, belated winning run off and running. Yeah, and it's just some stats before we get to uh, the trivia. Um, Newcastle aiming for a fourth successive home league win against Everton. So, OK, going well. Um, six of Everton's last seven league goals against Newcastle have been scored in the final 15 minutes. So Newcastle will need to be... Uh, on guard, especially towards the end of the game. And Alexander Isak could become the first Newcastle United player to score in five successive Premier League home fixtures since... Who do you reckon it is? Uh, Alan Shearer. Johan Gufra between November <laughs> and December. You couldn't read you know, more extreme ends there. Um, prediction? Are Newcastle going to beat Everton? Um, Newcastle are going to beat Everton... Two goals to one. Yeah. Two goals to one. There you have it. Yeah, I think they're going to win. And I'm going to go for a 3-1 victory. I'm going to go Bruno getting uh, getting on the score sheet Ooh. as well. Right. Um, and I wonder as well if the dinosaur will make a reappearance uh, in the Gallagher end. I know there's been plenty of talk about that. So I'm um, one to watch out for. Are you ready for some uh, trivia then, Aaron? Yeah, let's go. So a lot has been made of Newcastle United 4, Leicester City 3, back okay. in 1997. I think Aaron was about 1. Um, and the fact that the goals scored, yeah. from Newcastle's point of view, 
were exactly the same minutes that they scored their final three against West Ham. 77, 83 and 90. Unbelievable. Just utterly bizarre. But can you name the starting 11? You want the Leicester starting 11 or the Newcastle one? <laughs> no, make it easy for you. We'll have the Newcastle United one. So, right, so, uh, so can I have the date? So did you say 1997? Yeah, 2nd of February, 1997. So how old were yeah. we, Aaron? Um, 2nd of February, 1997. I would be six months old. Bless him. In Bless my Newcastle him. United baby grow. Um, watching on avidly, as you can imagine. Right, so, um, well, we'll obviously start. Well, we, instead of going from backwards to forwards, we'll go from front to back. So Shearer obviously scored the hat-trick, didn't he? He did. So you had Shearer up front with... Um, Les Ferdinand? Yep. And according to the Premier League website, they played three forwards up front. This might be why they conceded so many goals to begin with. Yeah, okay, right, okay. Uh, 97 would be... Oh, not Genoa. He likes the party, does this chap. He, yeah, was, I was going to say, is Tino still there? Yeah, Tino Aspria. With a, so Tino, Ferdinand and Shiva, the, the three forwards. Okay. Right. Um, in some, in some midfield. Yeah, it's his birthday today. Don't you also, I see him. I I saw him more as a defender, but the Premier League website here have got him down as a midfielder on this performance. Um, and it's his birthday today. Oh, um, I've I've seen it on on Twitter. Is it Steve Watson. It is. Um, we'll also go with. Uh, 97 we'll go Rob Lee yeah in the middle um, at the back we'll go Warren Barton nope you've got at the back you've got um, you've got a, a, a certain Belgian who could play uh, very well, Philip Al uh, so did you say it was three at the back three at the back um uh, Peacock Darren Peacock, yeah. Peacock, Albert, and this man had two spells at the club, and also his namesake is currently in charge of a local team. Um, Robbie Elliott, yeah. Uh, in goal, who are you going for? So, right, so 97, it would be... Oh, I'm, see, I'm torn between Cernicek and Hislop. And judging on your no no reaction there, I, I'm not sure if either of them are right. Um, no, it's one of them. It's one of them. Uh, Hislop. Shaka Hislop. That leaves you with two to get in midfield. Um, 97, is that... Is that... I want to say Ginola, but because they're playing three... Ginola one... came off the bench. So Ginola okay. came off the bench. Um, okay. 68 minutes on the clock. Lee Clark came off the bench as well with three minutes remaining. So okay. you can count them two out. We'll go for... Oh, uh, 97. We'll go Batty. Batty in the middle. Him and Wobbly picked up a boot gun each. Um, then on the so wing. On the wing. Um, can't be Solano. No, someone has said Solani a little bit early for that. Uh, a man who performed wondrously against Barcelona. Um, Keith Glasby. There we go. There we go. So you didn't do too badly there. I think I pretty much give you the all them uh, through <laughs> the clues. Um, but yeah, this has been the Monday show. And I just want to point you guys in the direction of last week's Monday show. It was a special one where me and Aaron picked... Uh, starting 11 best Newcastle United teams made up of concrete transfer rumours. We thoroughly enjoyed doing it. Um, I've, had a, I've had a few people actually stop me and say they enjoyed it and had fun picking their own team. Um, and I think, did you get my... So, obviously, I've been moving house and my uncle's been helping us build things in the in the house. And he, he said, oh, I was watching it. Yeah, I watched on YouTube. Great show. He said, I have to say, though, I, I did agree with Aaron's team the majority of Aaron's team. And actually, the people who have stopped me have pretty much said your team was a better team than mine, which I'm not very happy about. I'm grateful for the feedback. Thank you for watching. But, you know, 
he does get a lot of things wrong. So maybe I have to give him this one. Well, maybe I just think, you know, after all the slander for Calvin Phillips, you should probably finally put some respect on my name, like the like the viewers clearly are um, behind the scenes. So thank you to everyone who told Andrew that and, uh, and rubbed his face in it. But if you haven't watched it, head over to YouTube, scroll down on the podcast channel. It's a lot of fun. And if we've probably missed a lot of names out there that uh, we didn't include, the likes of Bastos, Tranqui Tranquilo Barnetta, <laughs> didn't get a mention either. Uh, but I think the two teams we picked, Aaron, uh, would would have won titles. And the, the team that we picked together would definitely have uh, just run wild over club football. So go and uh, have a watch of that. Let us know in the comments what your team would be and share it amongst your cast night support and friends and family. Head over to chroniclelive.com co.uk where there's a very special interview an exclusive interview going live um is it today or is it tomorrow with matty longstaff uh, which yeah, is going just, to be a, just gone live now yeah just so, gone live now long from Kieran and kelly so uh hit that up uh some really interesting things he said the first time i think he's gone on record about his exit from newcastle United. so you're going to want to cash that hit subscribe hit follow on the podcast it's been a pleasure and for myself and aaron I'll see you guys very soon.